Hallelujah. Thank you, Bell Choir, so much. As we gather, He is risen. He is risen indeed. That will be our greeting throughout this morning. Good morning. Happy Easter to you all. I'm Jim Miller, the senior pastor here at Grace. Welcome to all who are gathered in person and to all who are joining us online. We look forward to celebrating the Easter news with you and pray that this service will be meaningful in a way that will cause each of us to want to grow closer to the one who overcame all for us. I greet you in the name of Christ, the risen one. A couple of things about our service this morning that I wanted to share. First of all, there is a uh, notebook in each of the pews for those of you here. If you would just take a moment, if you haven't already, and sign that and pass that along to the person beside you. Online, if you would put your name in the chat. We just want to celebrate the fact that you are here, that you have taken this time to celebrate Easter here at Grace. On our altar this morning are white roses in loving memory of Fran Blenderman. Fran, a longtime member of Grace, passed this past week, and so our prayers go out to Marty and to the Blenderman family. And I can only imagine what Fran is experiencing, what the Easter celebration must be like in heaven. And so let us be keeping them in our prayers. For today's service, we are so glad that you are here, and especially we are thankful for our little ones who are here. That's not easy to get out the door with little ones, I remember. And so we are glad that you are here, and we hope that you will find this service meaningful for them as well. Now, we do offer our parlor, which is just over to, to my right in the back. If you ever need, if we call it our wiggle worship room. If you need a place to stretch with your little one at any point in the service, you'll still be able to hear the service in there. But please do not mind. I think it's joyful noise when we have our little ones here amongst us. That's not something I take for granted. In fact, I don't take for granted the fact that we can gather for our worship experience. We showed the video a few minutes ago of the that was put together in the midst of COVID, singers coming together and through technology to offer the powerful hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Each time I watch that video, it reminds me of a couple things. One, I love the diversity of that choir. To me, that's what God's kingdom looks like. And as I look out upon our gathering here, I give thanks for our diversity. I give thanks that it's more than a statement that we put on our Grace Notes or webpage. All are welcome. We are so glad that you are part of our gathering here at Grace. Speaking of all being welcome, we will celebrate Holy Communion in this service. We practice what's known as open table here at Grace and throughout the United Methodist Connection. What that means is all are welcome to come and to receive. Our ushers will guide you when it's time to come forward. Right now, we are dispensing communion in the plastic cup here. And again, I give a brief demonstration. We, we're having a bit of struggle with these. So when it comes time to open it, you just see the tab on there and press it all the way down till you hear it click. That will open it hopefully to the wafer that's on top and the juice. If you end up drinking the juice first and then the wafer, that's okay. You're not doing anything <laughs> sacrilegious there, all right? And we're going to get to the point, I'm hoping later this spring, when we won't have to do that anymore. We will offer this for those who aren't there yet, but know that that's something that we are keeping in mind. As a church, as I mentioned, we are part of the United Methodist Church, and we celebrate the connection of churches throughout the world. Starting next Sunday morning at 9.15, I, along with Deacon Helen Ballou, will be leading a class that talks about what it means to be United Methodist. I want to show you this brief video clip now that describes a little bit, that reminds us that we are, in fact, a connectional church. I invite you to watch the monitors.
This is who we are. And I invite you to be part of our gathering for next Sunday morning at 9.15. In addition to Sunday school for all ages, where we can gather and learn what it means to be and to be making disciples for Jesus Christ. Welcome. So glad that you're here. At this time, I'd like to invite all who are able to please stand for our call to worship. Christ is risen. Glory and honor, dominion and power be to God forever and ever. Hallelujah. Let us join in singing hymn number 302, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. It will be on screen as well.
Israel, we celebrate the fact that we worship a risen one. I invite you to be seated, please. And now let us open ourselves unto God in prayer. Let us pray together. God, our Father, by raising Christ your Son, you conquered the power of death and opened to us the way of eternal life. Let our celebration today raise us up and renew our lives by the Spirit that is within us. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. a bit of a head start here. I want to say welcome to all of our children who are joining us for this morning's children's message. So I'm going to enjoy, ask all those who are in person here to join me up front as I say good morning to those joining us online. Would you gather with me up here, please? I know it's a little crowded up here, but we can do this, okay? Very good, thank you. Welcome. How's everybody this morning? Happy, happy. I'm going to say the word, but I want you to tell me. What special day are we celebrating today? You knew it already, that's right. Have you, has your celebration started? You started it off well by coming to church. I commend you for that. I'm so glad that you are here. What else are you doing to celebrate Easter today? Just shout it out loud. What sort of things are you going to do? Find Easter eggs? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Well, sure. You know, I was thinking, I didn't do it. Wouldn't this space be a cool place to have an egg hunt? Could you imagine all the fun places that we would have to see? But... Why, what do eggs have to do with Easter? Does anybody know? Well, a long time ago, in a Sunday school class, a teacher asked the students that question. What do eggs have to do with Easter? And she gave them all an assignment to go out and to find something that would fit into the egg and talk about why that would refer to Easter. And so they did that. And so I wanted to show you a couple things that they did. The first student brought back an egg, and he opened it, and they said, what do you have in that egg? He said, I found a small cross. The cross, after all, reminds us of Jesus and the fact that he gave his life for us. So that was an important point, wasn't it? Then another student, another student came in and brought this egg. She said, I put a lifesaver in it. I thought, well, what's that have to do with Easter? Well, she explained, Jesus is our lifesaver. He's the one who gives us new life. So again, that was a very good response. Then another student, she brought in this green egg. And she opened it and they said, what do you have in there? She had a rock, a stone. I said, why, why a stone? She said, remember Easter morning? How they found the stone was rolled away from the tomb that Jesus was not dead, but was alive. And then they turned to Billy. Billy was a student who often got bullied at school. Bullying's a terrible thing, isn't it? He often got made fun of because he didn't often had trouble with the assignments and such. And so they turned to Billy and they said, Billy, what did you put in your egg? And he opened it and it was nothing. The other students started making fun of him and saying, see, Billy, you never get anything right. He said, no. The empty egg symbolizes the empty tomb. Jesus is not dead, but he's alive. All the students had good answers, but Billy's was the best, meaning that Jesus is with us always, that we have new life to celebrate. New life is something exciting, isn't it? I'll promise my technicians I'll stop turning around here and making that noise. Okay. Thank you. Something about new life brings new energy, doesn't it? So when we think about new Easter outfits or finding baskets or eggs and new discoveries, new life brings us new meaning. 
That's why I wanted you to meet somebody special here. Her name, Chibi. Chibi, isn't she sweet? New to this world. But just see what new life is doing. She got your attention, didn't she? <laughs> Notice how she's drawing you closer. That's what new life in Jesus does. God's love attracts us. God wants to be present for our lives. And so new birth reminds us that God is here for us. GB is being very gentle and a good sport about meeting us all for the first time. And maybe this is your first time at church today, or maybe you're hearing about Jesus for the first time. Know that Jesus promises to always be present for us, and that gives us an assurance. Even when we find ourselves in a strange land, God is always with us. And for that, we give thanks and praise. Thank you, Maxwell, for your help with GB. So as we go forth, oh, I see you discovered. All right. <laughs> We have an Easter egg for you to take with you. Would you take one? Sure, go ahead. Since you're already here, sure. And as you go back to your seats, I invite you to take an Easter egg and discover what's inside and know that there is joy that awaits you this day to be discovered that God is with us always. New life is ours to claim in Jesus. Thank you. To prepare our coming to the table this morning, let us pray together our prayer of confession. I'll start and you'll respond where the bold print appears. Christ, we come to the empty tomb. We meet our own death. We meet our own tomb. We meet our own emptiness. And we remember how we have treated other people, members of our family, friends, and neighbors. Lord, we come to your tomb we meet a hungry world before us, the pain of starving children, the guilt of war on our hands, and we know that collectively we share in those injustices. Lord, we come to the empty tomb. We search within ourselves and we cannot escape what we are. People caught up in the pain of our own wrongdoing, for some a deep sense of loneliness and frustration of what we would be but are not. Lord, when we come to the empty tomb, we lay before you our pain, our emptiness, and look to you for hope. People of God, why do you seek the living among the dead in an empty tomb? Are you afraid? Are you uncertain? And are you uncomfortable here? Our wounds are deep. We have turned away from that man. We have broken him seek his fellowship. Do not dwell on your wounds any longer, for he has risen to heal you. He has risen to forgive you. He has risen to change us all and bind us together now. Christ has risen to forgive us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now I invite all who are able to please stand as Bob shares with us the gospel news. Well, good morning, church. I share with you our gospel lesson this morning. It comes from Luke chapter 24, 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, 
taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this suddenly, two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven, to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and other women with them who told this to the disciples. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen clothes by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord for the people of the Lord. Let's ask you what great thing I know. Please be seated. I ask that you pray with me. Oh Lord, we thank you. We thank you that we have the Easter news to celebrate. All has been overcome. A right relationship with you is possible. Our eternal home, eternal life is ours to know in you because of Jesus Christ because of his life, his crucifixion, and his resurrection and ascension, we have new life to celebrate this day. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon this time of reflection as we prepare to come to your table, the true Easter feast. Oh, we anticipate our meals and our fun gatherings, but truly in this meal, this sacrament, we experience your presence anew. None of us have earned this invitation, yet all of us are invited Help us to respond. Allow your Holy Spirit to work in and through this time that you truly will be glorified, we pray. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. Well, it happened again last evening. Our house got egged. No, I don't mean an act of vandalism there. You may recall uh, last year we signed up for this, and we did it a second time. This wonderful organization called Safe and Sane works through many of our local high schools where they work to provide a safe place for students to gather after they graduate. So as a fundraiser, what they do is they offer to stuff and fill Easter eggs and then hide them in your yard for you. So I am so grateful for this, just for the fact, you know, having sunrise service and my wife Betsy working night shift, why it wouldn't have been possible for us otherwise, so now we can have an egg hunt for our grandchildren after, after the service today. They did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Now, take that to the nth degree, and you'll have what we are celebrating in the good news of Easter. Jesus has done for us what we could have never done for ourselves. Jesus makes it possible to have a right relationship with God, a full life, a complete life, eternal life, not something we earn, something that Christ has done for us. And so we celebrate this joy today. God wants each and every one of us to be in right relationship. All are welcome. This is the joy we celebrate. It wasn't a joyful moment when the women went to the tomb that Easter morning as Bob shared with us. They were grieving. They were mourning. They, they were hurting. Perhaps you come with a heart filled with grief this day. And yet, when they got there, they found that the stone was rolled away. I don't know how they had planned or what they thought they were going to do to be able to, to move that stone, but as an impossible obstacle as it must have been, they didn't let that stop them from making that journey that Easter morning. I'm so glad that you've let nothing stop you from coming to this time of worship online in person. I'm glad you didn't let the criticism of others or maybe of yourself keep you from celebrating the Easter news. What we see in their lives is this powerful transformation. They, they see the stone is rolled away. They go into the tomb. What courage! And Jesus' body's not there. They're no more beginning to contemplate what's happened when suddenly there are two angelic beings standing beside them, asking them the question, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And this moment of transformation occurs. For some of you, you can point to that moment. You can tell me the time and date and place you were when you accepted Jesus Christ in your life. For many of us, we cannot. But we know God has in somehow, some way, gradually worked in our lives where we've come to know there is joy, there is new life in the Easter news that we celebrate. It's all around us. I was glad to have the bunnies here to demonstrate what the, the beauty of new life, how that's attracting Barbara Brown Taylor, a while back, wrote this, this article entitled Old Clothes. She shared the following. She said, when I was a girl, I spent a lot of time in the woods, which were full of treasures for me. At night, I lined them up on my bed. Fat flakes of mica, buckeyes bigger than shooter marbles, blue jay feathers, bird bones, and if I was lucky... A cicada shell, one of those dry brown bug bodies you can find in those tree trunks when the 17-year-old locusts come out of the ground. I liked them for at least two reasons. First, because they were horrible looking, with their huge empty eye sockets and their six sharp little claws. 
by hanging them on my sweater, or better yet, in my hair, I could, I could usually get the prettier, more popular girls at school to run screaming away from me, which somehow evened the score. <laughs> I also liked them because they were evidence that a miracle had occurred. They looked dead, but they weren't. They were just shelves. Every one of them had a neat slit down its back where the living creature inside of it had escaped, pulling new legs, new eyes, new wings out of that dry brown body and taking flight. At night, I could hear them singing their high song in the trees. If you'd asked them, I bet none of them could have told you where they left their old clothes. That is all the disciples saw when they got to the tomb on that first morning. Those two piles of old clothes. I bet the women forgot. They had gone to anoint a dead body with spices. But suddenly they had new, exciting news to share. We see this transformation happening in their lives. My friends, as sisters and brothers in Christ, we have exciting news to share in the world today. We are about the work of creating Easter memories where we in the sacrament, in the fellowship at our donut party, I hope you were part of that, are coming together to sing the hymns of faith, gathering together together, As the body of Christ, we have a powerful message to take to the world. Easter memories to create that you are loved, that you are valued, that God has a plan for this world. God continues to roll stones away. Whatever those stones may be in your life, whatever obstacle, whatever difficulty that you are facing, whatever is weighing us down as a nation or in this world, God is not finished. God is at work. And that's what we celebrate and recognize we all have a role to play in creating these Easter memories. Sharon Ringy put it this way, as she shared, we can be helped to remember. When the memories of our hearts fail us, and like the apostles, we dismiss all this as a fantastic or idle tale, the liturgical memory of the church perhaps can lead us over that bridge into God's tomorrow role as the church? What memories of Easter are we helping to create? They're all pointing to the story where we experience the living presence of God and being offered a changed way of life. That's the message we have of Jesus Christ to bring to the world. That's what the, the angel said to the, to the women at the tomb. Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember what he told you. These powerful memories of Jesus' life. Memory not only of what occurred on Good Friday, but the memories of what Jesus did in his lifetime here on earth. Remember how he told you this way. Alan Culpepper reflected on this as well when he said, Remember what Jesus had done and what he had taught. Remember the meals in Jesus' fellowship, his healing and his parables, the bent woman and the ten lepers. Remember Galilee, the admonition to remember grounds the mystery of resurrection in the everyday world of human living, as well as in the demanding communal ethics that Jesus taught. This means that the boundless gift of the empty tomb cannot be separated from the words and actions of Jesus. Resurrection, after all, is not some buoyant ideal unconnected to the real world. It's an invitation to live as Jesus lived. A doorway to a life in which meals are shared with enemies. Healing is offered to the hopeless. Prophetic challenges are issued to the powerful. Only now it's not Jesus who does these things. It is we ourselves who see at last the subversive power of the resurrection in order to live it now. It's all around us. You see, we really didn't have to have an egg hunt at our house today. Here they were having one in our own neighborhood earlier in the week. I read about it, and so I called my daughter, who has our two grandchildren, and said, I know you're in Hagerstown, but right here in New Market, they're having an egg hunt. Could, could you bring the children over? And so, so they did. They were gathering in the soccer field right behind our house. I knew it would be close. It started at five and five till she pulled into the driveway and we just had to make the journey. My granddaughter, Reagan, three years old, she was primed for it. 
she had her basket, she was ready for this hunt. We were scurrying down the street to get there when we went a bit too fast and she tripped and fell. And I thought, oh no. Typically, a three-year-old, there, there's going to be a meltdown here. We're, we're, we're not going to make it. But she was so determined to get there, she got up from the ground as fast as she fell to it and kept going, not noticing the bruise, the injury on her knee, and we made it. Then as we gathered, I saw Christ at work in so many ways. I thought to myself, oh, there's no mention of Jesus, I bet, or nothing about the cross, but boy, did I see Jesus at work. The woman organizing the hunt, she had to be a school teacher. I mean, here were all these people, families I didn't realize lived in our neighborhood. You know how it is. You get in your everyday routines. You don't know. You don't realize who even lives around you. But they were all there. She didn't yell. In fact, she seemed to speak softer. And the children zeroed in to what she was saying. I remember her saying, eyes on me. And she said, thank you all for being here. She said, now we were limited to 10 eggs, but we expected more. So you can have more. But then I want to tell you something. As she explained, little ones over here, middle schoolers here, older children there. When you're finding the eggs and you see a friend who you've got plenty and they didn't get any, share with them. Or if you see somebody who's struggling, find them, help them out. She was demonstrating the gospel right before my eyes. She thanked us for being there, even though she had done the work to provide. She said, I was expecting more. Could it be that God is expecting more out of us and out of our life collectively together? And then she was giving them this instruction. Help one another. Remember the scripture where Jesus says, if you have two tunics and your brother has none, give the boy. Help one another. Be there for one another. This is how we are creating Easter memories as a people of God. The women played a valuable role in creating that Easter memory. When they saw this empty tomb, when they encountered these angelic beings, and were told to remember, it's now they go back to tell others. Even though women in that time were not valued or recognized as worthy, often seen as property. They told their story and others dismissed them saying, this, this is nonsense, but it didn't keep them from telling their story. Nancy Pittman put it this way about the women. He said, on that first dim Easter morning when women cowered in the dust and angels picked them back up, pointing them out the door of a tomb into the full light of morning, the power of God was no longer unspoken. The silence was broken and the women rushed back to tell the others about what they had seen. No matter that the others did not believe at first, who could believe under the circumstances? No matter that Peter had to test the women's story by running to the tomb, seeing for himself the linen clothes and wondering all the way back home about what he had seen. The women knew. The women remembered. The women believed. The women responded by breaking their own silence to speak their own truth. Which is, after all, exactly what God asks of you. May we no longer be silent when we see a neighbor who's in need. May we no longer be silent collectively when we see injustice in our community. May we no longer be silent when there's the need, when there's someone who does not know that their life is valued, that they are accepted. We celebrate as we come to the table God's love that expects us. There's nothing more loving than to have expectations after all. How sad if a parent does not have expectations of a child are God's expectations of you? Do we always fulfill them? No. But God is there to help us up when we fall. And that's what we celebrate as we come to the table. This weekend, with our Good Friday service, at noon we had that 12 to 3 p.m. time period 
that we traditionally think about that being the time when Jesus was on the cross. I try to find some quiet ways to spend that time after our service. We left it in silence. I came back to the church and one of the books I was looking at online was done by Reverend Hamilton a few years ago. We did a study of the seven last words of the cross. In that account, he shared about a man named Ron. Ron taught at an elementary school in Kansas City, Missouri. One day, Ron had to stay late, but when he came out and was walking across the school grounds, there was one of his students, Jonathan, still on the playground. He said to Jonathan, he stopped and talked to him and asked why he was still there, and he learned that Jonathan's mom had had left their family. His father was working all sorts of strange hours, so there really wasn't anyone at home. Ron talked with him and encouraged him to go home, and after that, he did special things to help Jonathan out. Later, Jonathan's dad had to put him into foster care. And then later, Jonathan came back to his father, back and forth. And finally, his father turned to Ron, his teacher, and asked him, would he prayerfully consider bringing Jonathan into their home and raising him? Well, Jonathan, as they said yes, was nurtured, would go on to graduate Kansas State University, would travel the country, Hamilton writes he would marry a beautiful young woman. He described her that way because the young woman was Adam Hamilton's daughter, Danielle. And he talked about how he had been praying for her one-day spouse since she was an infant. But little did he know that that person would be that young man early in life with such instability would be provided and cared for in a powerful way. That's the story of the gospel. Even though we go through unstable times, we've gone through some unstable times and battles with COVID as we come out of it. We go through times of division as a nation and in this world as we pray for the people of Ukraine and all who are in need. But we are reminded that God is at work. In the Easter memory we celebrate this day is the fact God is not finished. We give thanks that God continues to work in this world. What Easter memory are you creating? How is your life in seeking Christ providing an example to someone else? A while back I was visiting my mother in Ohio. and We got on the subject of Easter. She asked if we were doing a sunrise service. I said, oh yes, we did. She said, I remember when you were very small, I got up for sunrise service, our choir was singing, and I happened to remember that Easter gifts were still in the trunk of the car, so I needed to carry those in before I left, and I went to do it, and it was so cold, the trunk was frozen shut. So I went in and woke your father, and he came out, and we struggled to get the trunk open. Finally, we boiled some water and poured it on there, and we finally got it open. I took off praying that nobody would stop me for speeding as I made my way to church, she said. And I got there just in time as the choir was processing in and I joined the procession. Now that's been a lot of years ago. I couldn't tell you what gift we got that Easter morning. I don't think she could either. But her telling that story reminded me and spoke to me today. And how even when we face the challenges... Even when we face the frustrations of life, she continued. She could have called it a day and said, forget it, I'll sing in next year's service. But she continued on. And that inspired me. And I pray that will inspire you this day, despite whatever battle you're facing, that we continue in this journey. Because your Easter memory that you're helping to create is vital to this world. I close with this passage that Ricky, Pastor Ricky, shared some years ago. He wrote, The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead was never meant to be proved but experienced. As a matter of fact, it cannot be proved as no one one of us was there. We have to take the word of others who were. Those early witnesses were very passionate about their testimonies. 
Many were to be martyred in defense of their convictions, but ultimately the resurrection is to be experienced, not proved. The most convincing evidence of the resurrection of Christ is the transformation of the people who know Jesus and believe in him. I decided long ago the only proof of Easter I will ever need is memory. I remember what my life was like before I met the living Christ, and I know what my life is now as I share it with him. I would not stand here and tell you I'm always the man I should be, but thanks to the living Christ, I'm not the man I used to be either. The risen Jesus Christ has made all the difference. May that be the Easter memory being created in your life and mine and our life together as a community of faith. Thanks be to God. We celebrate anew the Easter news this day. Amen. And so with thanksgiving in our hearts, we participate in the work of Christ in many ways, and one of those ways is through our morning offering. And so we invite our ushers to come forward as our choir shares with us. so much. I invite you to join me now in our words of the great thanksgiving, and this morning we will sing our responses. 
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. <laughs> Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Now, as children of God, we are bold to proclaim, and I invite you to say this prayer in whatever way you have learned it, and the words are before us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The body of Christ given for us, the blood of Christ shed for us, the true Easter memory is ours to claim and live this day. All are welcome to receive. I invite our servers to come forward. All are invited to receive. The ushers will guide you forward. Let us sing the Easter hymns as we receive this day.
Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the Easter memories being created this day. Thank you for meeting us right where we're at. Thank you for hearing the pleas of each of our hearts and for those that we intercede for. Lord, none of us leave here the same person that came in, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. Thank you for how your Holy Spirit continues to lead and work in our lives and through our life together. Be with all those everywhere who look to you, who are wondering this day is their hope. We are reminded there is hope in the one who meets us in this holy meal. Bless us, O God, and use us to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Debbie is going to give us a word of instruction about our closing hymn there. Good morning, Debbie. In a second, I'll ask you to rise and sing our closing hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns. There's a 17-measure, I know you know what that means, 17-measure introduction. I'll bring you in on the first verse, and between the third and the fourth verse, there will be a slight interlude, and I'll bring you back in for the singing of the fourth verse. So if you will rise, if you're able, let's sing Crown Him with Many Crowns. As you go forth this week, I want to give you these challenges as we live out the gospel news that we have celebrated this day. What memories of Easter are you helping to create? 
How are these memories pointing to the story where we experience the living presence of God and are being offered a changed way of life? As Dr. Ringy wrote, how can the liturgical memory of the church lead us over the bridge into God's tomorrow? Secondly, how are we helping create a whole new round of witnesses to the powerful story of Easter? As Rick Cahoon shares, the risen Jesus Christ has made all the difference. How is the risen Christ making a difference in your life? And now we're all going to be part of the choir as we're going to join in singing right where you're at, the Hallelujah Chorus. Thank you for being here today.
forth in his name. He is risen. He is risen indeed.